for me, development and career was like at the top of everything. So I yeah. was just always listening to everything. I think it really was the focus that I found. Welcome to Profession Session. I'm your host, Brody Vinson. And in this show, I interview all types of professionals, whether they be corporate stars, business owners, or entrepreneurs, and just talk a little bit about what they do in their field and what's made them successful so far. And today I have a very special guest, Jake Pelkey, who is actually my editor behind the scenes for a lot of my videos and has his own thriving career aside from that. So we're going to get into it a little bit. Jake, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It's nice to be on this side. I'm I know. This is long overdue, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you've been helping me out for a while now, and also you've been just doing awesome stuff in your own career and getting promoted pretty much every time I talk to you. So <laughs> I figured we would have a lot to talk about. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it does move quick in my career. So yeah, we'll talk about whatever. We always seem to have good conversations. So I guess the best place to start would just be like, your background a little bit. Let's talk about coming out of college. What were you looking at? What did your job prospects look like? And what did you kind of start doing out of college? Yeah, so out of college, I was one of those fall graduations. So it was 2019 fall. So I was like, oh, awesome. Nothing crazy is going to happen after yeah. graduation here. I had already been working part time at like Universal doing like a, a merchandise retail just like basically glorified retail in the stores there at Marvel. I had gotten a job that like previous summer because my dad was like harassing me about getting a job. And I think I applied for like food and beverage and I went in they were like, well, it seems like you would be better in merchandise. And I was like, please, I didn't yeah. get food and beverage at all. You were just kind of like, yeah, that sounds better to me. Yeah. So I got in there and it was pretty good. I graduated and I was like, okay, well maybe I'm looking at different things. Maybe I can try to go full-time here while I do. And then March of 2020 hit, and everything shut down for, like, a while. So that was a big reset. I like, just... very, very shortly after you got hired. Very, yeah. yeah. It was. What like, did that feel like? Um, it was crazy. I remember graduating and thinking, like, wow, I spent my whole life in school, like, and I don't know what it's like mm -hmm. getting out of school. And then they just flipped. They said, well, now you're not going to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah. It was an insane time for everyone, really. Like it, it shook up everyone's life, career, et cetera, in a completely different way. Yeah, and it was crazy being there because they like never shut down, like for multiple days. Maybe for mm -hmm. like a couple days for the hurricane, or whatever. But it was just all these mumblings. It was crazy going into work, and they were like, "Well, okay, they're gonna have us come in, but we'll just clean, or no, we're gonna stay and they'll pay us at home." and all this stuff, so eventually they just sent us home in the middle of the day, and then they were going to pay us for a while, or for two weeks, and then two weeks turned into a few months, and then they wow. kind of just furloughed us for a while, mm -hmm. especially me being part-time at the time. Um, but Just a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. At first, yeah. you know, I was honestly a little bit like, yeah, I'll, I'll take a break. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Animal Crossing just came out, so. <laughs> I have that, that. It was right around that time. I think Animal Crossing was either lucky or very genius with that i know yeah a little suspicious but <laughs> little suspicious all right we'll go ahead and throw it out there animal crossing started covid yeah <laughs> <laughs> everyone Headline. was thinking it right <laughs> um but after a while i definitely it was, it was pretty frustrating i wanted to get moving with my career and i wanted to get going i especially college in the latter part i felt like okay i get it everyone's telling me well when you get in your career when you get in your career it's like well i want to get into it i want to yeah. buy all this knowledge and you're just, ready yeah, and it was tough. And then restrictions started lightening up a little bit, but it was still difficult to go out um, and kind of like find a job. I no one really wanted to meet face to face at that time, and like separating yourself on online through like a resume was really kind difficult. of a new thing. Yeah, yeah. And there was I felt like I found a lot of like weird marketing job like jobs that would describe themselves as i know exactly what yeah. you're talking about they're they would reach out and be like hey we it, they would like describe themselves as a marketing job you would get on the phone with them and they'd be like hey we want you to like sell iphones in the back of a target 
Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or like, oh, we're selling windows at some, you know, it's yeah. just like, it, it was a ton of that. And then it got really weird because then there were like legitimate sales jobs I would get, but it would be hard to differentiate. But I never wanted to get into sales myself. I've never loved selling things like to people that don't want it. You yeah. Know? I've just never really been about that. That's yeah. why retail, I felt somewhat comfortable because you're coming in. Yeah. That stuff, and I felt like I could be kind of honest, but um, yeah, eventually I, I kind of found a new career path. I've, of course, I edit the podcast, so I've always kind of been back and forth between this business and the editing. I got a business degree because I thought it could support my editing and everything. And you had a position where you were editing before. Yeah, so that's how I found this one. Um, I was living downtown at the time, and I would just walk around, and then there was this one studio that I would, like, find. I found, like, a couple blocks from me, and I was like, I'll just look them up, and there was no, like, job positions available or anything. But I was just like, whatever. Like, I'm so desperate. Like, I'm just going to email them and tell them I experienced Interesting. Yeah. So no... No job postings whatsoever, but you just, like, saw them, like, had an interest and just emailed them. Yeah, they had, like, a, con you know, contact us for whatever, and I just said, what am I going to lose, you know? Yeah. So I, I had done some it's things. It's a great mentality, the what am, what do I have to lose mentality. I mean, like, yeah. if you want something and you, you like, want to involve yourself in something, you literally have nothing to lose by just trying and reaching out. Yeah, I definitely hadn't always been like that, but I'd, I've gotten better, and especially at that point in my life, it was, like... I literally had nothing to lose, yeah. you know? Um, so I sent that in. I, I was described in high school. I took video production, like, the entire time. And I had a couple. I had an internship at our local no network access uh, television. And um, I would just pick up things, like a teacher would want their wedding, their daughter's wedding video edited or I would do the school play or something like that, you know. I would always do that kind of stuff. So I, I just described all that, sent it in, and then he actually responded and said, hey, can you send me some work and stuff? So I scraped up some stuff that I've been doing, and then we actually had an interview, and I ended up getting a job there. It's, it was Talking Head Studio is the place. It's They do great work there. It paid off for my degree to get – I wanted a business yeah. degree and to legitimize my video experience, I guess, and – he had expressed that's why he had interest in me because he said he sometimes he'll get interest like that, but having that dual side that maybe yeah the marketing. combination of both yeah and that's I ended up doing a little bit of their social media as well like towards the end of it so that really helped but yeah Talking Head was great they do a lot of like corporate videos kind of business will hire them for YouTube advertisements um, live events were big for them as well we had a lot of different people we would work with. So there was some chiropractors that we really knew really well. One scoliosis doctor, which was good for me because I have scoliosis. And so there you go. Yeah. You got to learn a lot. Yeah. What were a couple highlights of working there? Either clients you dealt with or like things that you learned like on the job, that kind of thing. My favorite moment was like my last day there before I had started another thing. I did the Florida Cup for soccer. We filmed that. So ESPN was doing the main line coverage, the wide shots and everything. They contracted us because they have a really good partnership with Citrus Sports, which does like the Citrus Bowl and all that kind okay. of stuff. So running around there, I'm not a huge soccer fan, but everyone went crazy. The fans were nuts, like running through the rafters, like filming. They're fun to go to. Ball. They're really fun to go to. Oh, yeah. The fans are like, they're a different kind of fans. You don't really see yeah. them anywhere else. Like they're just so getting, happy. involving yourself in that whole kind of vibe is really wild. Yeah, it was. And having backstage passes and stuff, like being able to flash my badge, felt pretty baller. But um, Being able to flash a badge at any event is crazy. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That that was definitely a highlight. Um, there was some other, you know, we worked with, um, I liked working with the Orlando Informer. They were really fun. We did a lot of cool, like 30, Orlando's 30 under 30 or 40 under 40 and um, we got to meet a lot of people, kind of reminiscent of what you do with your podcast, just like a yeah. wide variety of professionals that we really got to see and and people who are passionate about their work and everything. So I like that. But every day was different, you know. We got to go down. Sometimes we would go close to Miami, and they would put me in a hotel room, which I was like, nice. Like, yeah. Kind of a 
check mark of mine to like nice kind of benefit up, yeah right yeah like be able to have but getting to travel for work yeah so that was cool yeah just for a short time but that was fun eventually i ended up leaving though because the video production work is great and i feel like when i'm doing it i'm like thriving mm-hmm. but it's so feast your famine sometimes and they had talking head had just had a really good season when I was there at the first and then it was kind of slowing down a lot so I didn't have as much work and originally I kind of planned on doing something else but I reached out to some of my old managers at Universal and they were like oh yeah you did great work before and we'll bring you on full time like it was like too much so I couldn't really like work with him because the schedule is flaky as well Mm -hmm. with Talking Head I think they just kind of sometimes I lived really close, so he would call me, hey, like, come in in five minutes. Right, okay. okay. That doesn't really, like, work. Yeah. Like, working at a No, it's something job. else. So, uh, yeah. I went back there, and I wasn't totally thrilled at first, to be honest, just because I was just doing, like, something I was super passionate about, but, like, I wanted more work. And yeah. I went back to that, that position I had in college at full time, but, like, I was just an associate and everything. But, um. Yeah, I I went back and I kind of came with this mindset, like I kind of knew how everything worked and I was out of college. I learned how to work really hard because I had just worked for a company where I had to work really hard um, for something that I love. So I was just like, I just want to work. I brought that passion with me and I wanted to move up. I wanted to, I knew there were so many opportunities. So I just kind of came in with a, a refreshed sense of everything and it was a different mentality. So... Basically, I worked there for six months as an associate, and I was kind of, like, dying towards the end of it. I was, like, yeah. I'm just standing around, like... Like, for you know, what? Kind of yeah. Thing. yeah. I, I just felt like I had so much to offer. Not seeing it pay off. Kind yeah, of thing. exactly. But it was kind of slowly building. I had an advantage, because some people had known me before, and some people were new from mm-hmm. like upper management, so... Some people could vouch for me, and there's kind of like a little wiggle room in like what I knew and what I didn't know. I feel like sometimes silence is your best friend. Yeah. And uh, not totally disclosing everything. Maybe they can add their own assumptions that you're like, maybe know a little bit more. Yeah. Sense. Elaborate on that a little bit. How is that best executed? So I think that what I've noticed about people a lot is that they, they kind of treat you like a paint by numbers kind of thing and you can populate it yourself Mm -hmm. when you speak and paint the picture but if you kind of just say a few things people automatically fill in stuff from their imagination if they like really like you then oh well maybe yeah he's really smart so he probably knows all this or he's done this one thing so they fill this in um and i kind of use that to my advantage a little bit. I never try to mislead anyone or yeah. anything. But, um, you know, I think that... But you kind of let people fill in the, the numbers the way they would like to. And yeah. if it works to your benefit, it works to your benefit. Yeah, exactly. I like. I've never heard that analogy before. I like that. Yeah, it kind of reminds me when people... When I was younger, I heard some people say, like, oh, you don't love her, you love the idea of her. I'm like, mm-hmm. what do you mean by that? But, like, I understand. It starts to make sense the more you you think about it. I think about that concept a lot. That's interesting. Yeah. Because sometimes you can, like, like, you're like, oh, I really like this person. Mm -hmm. You're kind of just really infatuated at the moment, and you really don't know that much about them. Yeah. Kind of fill in, like, your future with them. Hey, been there, brother. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I think we all have at some point. That's interesting. I like that paint-by-numbers analogy a lot. Oh, thanks. Use it if you want. Yeah. (laughs) Just trademark. Could be a clip. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, there's a little like TM Jake Pelkey at the bottom. Right. That's all. That's all. Yeah. 10%. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> Any kind of residuals. Yeah. yeah. So there are some things like helping out with inventory that I did once cause I filled in and like one of my old managers, like, you know, I, I know you, so you can do it. Like, and then someone else like, Oh, so you did inventory. So you've been doing that for a while. And I'm like, yeah, I did the inventory, you know, like, <laughs> you're like, I know inventory. Yeah. And he's like, paint, 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 paint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that kind of helped me a little bit. But I think another thing I carried with me before was that I learned people can't read your mind. A lot of people think that it's very clear what your ambitions are. Or mm-hmm. you really, 
like I would think everyone wants to move up, right? Everyone wants to do this or that. And that's not the case. And the managers won't treat you like that if you don't bring it up. So I yeah. kind of just made sure every single person that I worked with at a higher level knew my intentions. What are some examples of you approaching managers and bringing that to their knowledge? Because I think this is really valuable. It's a That's a point that's lost pretty often is that you you have to actually make it known that you want to move up. Right. Yeah. I felt the easiest segue for me was to ask them how they got to where they were. It just kind of starts a conversation. People love to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you learn from everything because I think that was kind of like, well, I can follow in your footsteps. Yeah. Um, Some people started where I was and some people came in at different levels, but... You learn that. And then at the end, I can kind of throw in like, oh, that's great because I really like want to move. I want to be where you are. I want to be somewhere else. And so like, sure, valuable to know that. And especially if you ask them that first and you, you know, that you're going to kind of like bridge that gap eventually, you can kind of say, oh, it's great that you got there doing this, this and this. I would love to get there. And I'm super excited to do this, this and this. And here's my plan for how I'm going to do this, this and this. And actually... Maybe even I will do this, this, and this better in this way. Yeah. You can kind of just, like, structure exactly your plan for it based on it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think they were really receptive about that. A lot of people, especially I found, like, in the parks, they around me really love to lend help and, like, lend because they've had people in the past, maybe they've wanted people to help them more, so they've kind of been really good if you're vocal about it and and reminding them i think it's good mm-hmm. to like keep in mind that just because you had that conversation once like a month ago doesn't mean that it's they're busy and it might not be top of mind exactly yeah. yeah so making sure to bring that up so i kind of did that a lot and then there was kind of this position for this inventory management side doing stock and inventory and everything and i kind of had heard i kept my ear out and just kind of was hearing that this one girl was leaving and she was in charge of the main store in Marvel but she didn't really announce but someone some heard rumors and everything so I kind of heard that I was like oh okay so now is my chance to really like capitalize on this and I know this position is going to be available so I really want to make sure that I'm at the top of people's minds why do you think that you were able to have your ear to that and have that knowledge even though it wasn't necessarily privy to everyone because it's very valuable okay. knowledge, and it kind of led to you like understanding that there might be a position becoming available. Yeah. And obviously, to to become privy to that information, you're either either management or you're just keeping your ear to things, and you're you're ready to hear it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people I found as associates on that level, they kind of treat it. A lot of people treat it like high school a little bit in the way that when I was in high school, I was so like over school and I just wanted to, I just wanted to be a part of the social aspect. I wanted to, you know, and sometimes people would blow stuff off. I would, I never skipped class or anything, but I felt like I didn't take it as seriously as I would. And some people kind of really treat it. They, they're really focused on the relationships there, which are good. I think it's just people focusing on different things. But for me, development and career was like at the top of everything. So I yeah. was just always listening to everything. And I'm pretty- It was just always yeah, your focus. Yeah, I'm pretty detail oriented as well. So I think I'm always paying attention to details that mm-hmm. maybe other people aren't. But I think it really was the focus that I found. Um, just keeping that focus at all times. You probably heard things that other people didn't hear. Mm-hmm. We're always just on the top of it. I moved on from there and we, kind of had a lot of leadership change at that point too because the CEO had changed over. The CEO is Karen now, which is kind of, everyone's like, well, but she's <laughs> actually great. What a tough position to be in in this day and age. I know. Having the name Karen. Right. Like, you start to kind of feel bad for any Karens that have good intentions. Yeah, and you probably spent like a good part of your there. life like being a normal Karen. Mm-hmm. You know? And then all of a sudden. Do you get just, pegged with this label of just being a Karen and Maybe you have great intentions. It's not rough. Like a good nickname for Karen either. You can't really change. No, there really isn't. <laughs> yeah. There really is no way of shortening it. Yeah. It's tough. <laughs> Typically, they try to change leadership like every three years. And I think there were some people that 
overstayed a little bit in different areas. So it seemed that she kind of just said, everyone. She's going to clean house. Yeah. 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 I mean, people kept their jobs, but like they shifted around. Okay. Like, so it's good for like any area to get like fresh looks, fresh ideas, and just kind of like yeah. that kind of thing. It all happened at once. Usually it's a little gradual, but it was just kind of like every now and then. So our main area manager changed, who I think that was a, that was a pretty good opportunity for me too, because I think the last area manager really knew me, and he kind of knew that I probably didn't want to spend my time like forever in the parks, which he liked, and he saw potential in me, but he also kind of had this attitude of like, well, why would I promote him to something when he's going to leave? Sure. Which is yeah. understandable, I guess, to an extent. That's a very interesting dance I have noticed with, like, not only you, but, like, a lot of our friends that are very ambitious in whatever they're doing is that, like, there's this kind of dance between, like, having great ambition and the, the kind of subtext that comes along with that, which is that, you might not want to do the thing that you're doing forever and you might want to like move on to bigger and better things, Mm -hmm. but also like moving up and like in what you're doing. And I think it really falls on the organization and the management to be able to recognize that and see that you are a great asset to the company and continue to promote you and give you more opportunities and fulfill what it is you're looking for in a career. Mm-hmm. to keep you around, right? Because you can't really keep great talent around if you don't do those things. Yeah, exactly. And they probably wouldn't stay with you anyway. Exactly. It's just underutilization, really. But um, after that, I had a kind of manager below that kind of talked to me. It was like, you know, maybe don't mention all the time that you want to go to different departments or something mm-hmm. like, which... I kind of stopped, but I felt like with this new manager, I was very able to become more transparent. I think I got better with that, just kind of like being totally like obvious with my intentions, but delivering it in a soft way. Kind of. So I was able to talk to him and kind of, especially when I don't exactly know how the room's going to go, because we really don't, even if we do really think so. So kind of just saying, well, this is what I want, but I don't know, but I could also be interested in this. and. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, especially earlier in your career, right? You, you have kind of an idea of you, of the way you would like it to go, but it's very likely it's going to go in a totally different direction and that that is what you kind of wanted but didn't know you wanted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that happens to me more than me predicting. What mm-hmm. I want, but I kind of ended up having this one-on-one with him at a good time right after I had heard that position was probably going to be open. And... You know, I didn't go in saying, like, I know this is open and I want it. But, like, kind of doing it again, explaining, like, you know, I don't know where I'm going to go. I, I keep all my options open. But I figure moving up here would only help me in a, in a lot of different areas and, and anywhere I go. And I've heard that a lot of managers went up in this stock position, this inventory position. And so I saw in his eyes, he's like, oh, in his mind, he's like, oh, this is perfect because he doesn't mm-hmm. know. But, but I did know. So yeah. he kind of like brought up, oh, well, we do have this position available. Would you be interested in it? Kind of breached the topic without breaching the topic. Right. Yeah. As I say, I'm being transparent, but also kind of like. Playing good corporate politics. Yeah. You know, I think there's kind of, there's a good balance of like networking, politicking, but being honest as yeah. well. And I think just owning up to the fact that it is a thing. Mm -hmm. but, like, doing it in the best way. I ended up taking that position. It kind of wasn't on paper my ideal position because you had to be there for the shipments before the morning when they came in, so I had to get up at 4.30 every day to be there at 6. That was tough. I'm a night owl, so, like... Yeah, so it's a big adjustment. Yeah, I would much more likely be up till 4.30 than, like, getting up. Exactly. I I had a job with a mutual friend of ours in college where we worked at Academy Sports mm-hmm. and we had to be there at 2.30 in the morning to receive the 3 a.m. shipment so that we could like stock the shelves. It took the life out of me. It was insane. Yeah. It, was, <laughs> it was ridiculous. I mean, I, I have like flashbacks and nightmares of it. 
Right. Because then you're like, oh, I have all this day. But then you're, like, exhausted. You know? It was literally 3 a.m. to 12 p.m. was the oh, shift. Yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it was tough. I think I was attracted to it a little bit because it was consistent, mm-hmm. which is very for that associate position. You just don't know if, you know, sometimes you're – up until midnight, sometimes you're, like, doing a morning shift. and It was more consistency up. than you were used to at the time. Right, yeah. I was able to coordinate with people who had regular jobs, because I, I think I had Wednesday, Thursday off at that time. And I was like, oh, I just want to work work my way to a regular weekend. Yeah. Which I have, finally, just barely. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I ended up taking it, and it's just, just more something more engaging. Anything where I can, like, use my talent and not just, like, sit around and luckily this position although it is like stock stock in the shelves really isn't like even my job or like Mm -hmm. doing any of that because it's really like for the associates it was really about like display minimums we didn't have full control over like what product we got in we could make suggestions but like it was more like where we place them what sells best being in the merchandising and like in the retail sector of it what are, like, your top three takeaways of what did and didn't do well as far as actual, like, retail merchandising? It was a very unique area, especially even in Universal, because, first of all, it's a blend of retail and, like, hospitality. So mm-hmm. you're always keeping this in mind while we are focusing on product that's Marvel-related. Like, we do also have to have things we have to focus in different areas like okay well if people are coming in in this area then maybe we should have some sunscreen because they're like starting off you know like like touristy things but there's also things that are like product for marvel to keep in mind but then also universal doesn't own marvel's ip so you disney owns it our like biggest competitor i remember you talking about this and like the struggles with that is just like a lot of a lot of like unknowns and like kind of navigating uncertain waters trying to figure out like what you could and couldn't do, like how to promote things, like whether you could promote certain things. Right. Yeah, and so that was kind of a thing. I think timing is huge, especially for Marvel, I think, just to be on top of, they come out with a lot of content, be on top of that, but it makes it difficult because... You can't necessarily promote everything. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have proper confirmation of what Disney's doing, but... It did seem very odd that they would get, if if Thor Love and Thunder is coming out, they have it two weeks before, but then it takes two months for us to get it, you know? Like that kind of thing. And we'd have to buy a third party. So it's hard to do that. But I know, like, when No Way Home came out, that was kind of like a moment. Like, that was kind of, I feel like a return to theaters. Kind of everyone went back to see that kind Mm -hmm. of thing. And while we weren't able to get No Way Home merch at first... We did have a bunch of Spider-Man merch. People are dumped into that store. So we, mm. we broke records for that store. Gotcha. For, okay. For getting that. So I think timing is huge. I think, kind of what I was mentioning before, like traffic flow. Um, in my store, there was some character meet and greets. So it's, Spider-Man was kind of in the back. So placing your Spider-Man products in that way, placing your youth products over there because, you know, kids are going to want to go, I think, um, like flow there or like when I was leaving Marvel they were doing construction on the other side so people can come in on that side so we had to totally transfer product well this is our top selling product so maybe we want it in the front but like I also had a lot of conversations with management where I was like well if it's our top selling product like why why waste a good space when we know it's going to sell anyway Mm -hmm. right like maybe it would be more valuable to push a product that's underperforming but maybe it's just not in the right place so watching those numbers um Hmm. there were different things what were some like examples of that kind of thing working out where you like promoted something that was underselling over like over something that was like the obvious choice um i think a lot of there's some products like like plush or other things where there was a variety like action figures maybe, like there was the same brand but a variety of the character, so we knew a certain character sold really well. Right. Kind of a lot of things we would do is kind of putting product lower so kids would grab it. And then oh, interesting. And then a parent doesn't want to take that out of their hands. Yeah. <laughs> like that kind of thing. Yeah, if I think back to like 
as a kid when I was visiting parks, I'm sure there was examples of that where I'd just grab something and I ended up getting it because no parent wants to like wants to say no to their kid. Right. Like in their hands. Yeah. And it's interesting. Me I would have never person. thought of just thinking to put it lower just so that it appeals more to kids a little bit. Yeah. And if they talk to me directly, I'm like, oh, you know, you know, whatever. I'm I'm the nice guy. But like mm-hmm. strategically in the morning before everyone's there, I'm like, oh, why don't we put stuff? Yeah. You know, <laughs> just why don't we put things. it about eye level right here? Yeah. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. And I even had access to some programs for sales that I wasn't really, not everyone in my position gets access to, but I, I just talked closely to some managers who I would consider mentors, but I kind of try to use everyone as a mentor because I find that you can find value in anyone. But some people, I was more connected than others. So, Could you elaborate on that point a little bit more? Because I really like that point, just being able to find value in anyone. What, what does that look like to you? Like day to day. Um, well, in my teams back in the parks, I felt that different managers really offered different things. They oversaw different. I had some people under stock. I had some people under cash flows. I had some people under just rotations. And some people had different stores and stuff. So um, they would assign you a mentor. Like, this is your mentor. Like, you know, you didn't have any choice in that. But. I felt some people, I was, I would tell people, like, why even worry about that? Like, everyone can be your mentor. They're a wealth of knowledge. Like, and every person can offer something different. And I think that increases your connection with them yeah. as well. And kind of. Yeah, if you're asking you know, them questions about what they do, people like to talk about what they do and like to be. Yeah. People like to be validated by being asked about what they do. Because mm-hmm. it makes it feel to them like what they do is valuable. Yeah. And I've, I feel like I stood out a lot for asking questions that really weren't relevant to, you know, my day to day, I mm-hmm. guess. Um, some people say dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Um, when I was an associate, even like a stalker, I didn't have that option because I had to wear an outfit. But in a, in a professional sense, I felt that I would dress for what I wanted in the sense that I would ask people questions that didn't have anything to do with me. But I want to know. Like, mm-hmm. when I'm in a in a position in the future, I want to be able to know that kind of stuff. And, yeah. I, Sounds like the kind of just general idea here, moral of the story, if you want to call it that, is just be curious and, like, and ask questions whenever you can about different departments. Yeah. If you're in a big corporate setting, especially like you were in our – is just be curious about all parts of it and ask about all parts of it because you never know where there could be an opportunity or you could learn something. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I hate when someone asks me something and I have to say I don't know. I will. Mm -hmm. I'll be accountable and say I don't know and not make something up. But I don't want to do it again. Yeah. Like I want to be able to be that person. And I kind of became that person a lot in my my following position. Like they're just kind of like, well, he, he can do anything. You know, That's a great you know. point. There's there's so much value to becoming that person that knows the answer to a lot of things and can cover a lot of areas because I feel like a, a manager above you is going to want to promote that person because they're like, oh, this is the guy or girl that people above them just go to or people that are associates of theirs just go to to get stuff answered. They're like the go-to to just – get an answer or get a problem solved, et cetera, Mm -hmm. why would we not promote them? Because they clearly have a way of getting stuff figured out or just having the answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, they really worked out in that way. I think you have to be naturally curious, so you can't like fake it. You can't act like you want to know all these things. I mean, some people just love to learn. Some people are- Yeah, you can't just ask and not actually want to know the answer. Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to retain it that way. Yeah, and I feel like it really came from, it was really cool to be in that position coming from my dad owned a business. I wanted to get into this. We have a deep connection on this in that, like, our dads were both business owners. I think we both have a little bit of an entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, my dad did retail. Um, Your dad did, too, Mm -hmm. I guess, in a 
in, in a little more serviceable sense. A little bit of sales and a little bit of retail by the end of it. Like they both kind of like combined to form like one cohesive company, but definitely a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. So just seeing he, my dad ran an archery shop, Pelkey's Archery. Um, it was mainly, you know, we did a lot of recreational archery and everything, but the store, the retail part was very focused on like outdoor hunting stuff because that was just kind of the niche within the niche that would attract the most attention. Yeah. Because people still, I'm like, I mentioned archery. They're like, what? Like bow and arrow? Kind of yeah. Thing? Yeah. Coming from that and then having the resources of a billion dollar company. I mean, just being. I think we should take this as a chance to mention. I'm sure you're a humble guy. You would never mention this yourself. Weren't you like the number two or three archer in like the United States at one point? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I was third when I was like 12, end of middle school kind of thing. Yeah. I, I was in, I went to national competitions all the time. And That's wild. Like, yeah. Yeah. Briefly. As I got older, you know, I got. Distracted by other things and professions, sure, yeah. but yeah, I was. It was fun, you know. It's kind of tough remembering. At, at one point, I guess I did want to be like professional, but everything that I do, I kind of they're like, w- "What do you want to do with this?" I'm like, "Well, I want to take this as far as I can, like mm-hmm. just because I feel like I have to," you know. Yeah. And then the question of like, do I really want to, kind of comes into play later. But. Right and. I would guess it's a little, it's probably a little difficult to make a career out of like professional archery just because it's not necessarily featured in like mainstream sports or I guess it's it's in the Olympics, right? Like it's, yeah. it is in the Olympics, so you could go Olympics, but it's not like at least speaking for the United States, it's not necessarily featured in mainstream sports. So it probably would have been difficult to carve out a career with it. Yeah, some people did, um, but it wasn't, you know, it was comfortable, but it wasn't anything crazy. Because like you said, just no one, the sponsorships aren't really there. If they, yeah. they are, they're from a, a smaller company that doesn't. That's really the big thing is sponsorships a lot yeah. these days. And the Olympics was tough because one, like, you know, you don't make money at the Olympics. They don't cut you a check there. And like, the other thing is like at the Olympics, you have to use a recurve bow, which is this kind of like more traditional style, like, cause I shot compound, which had gotcha. the pulley system. It, it makes it easier to hold because it takes, I'm sure it's more nowadays, but 80, 85% of the weight off. So if you're pulling- That's major, yeah. Yeah, versus a recurve, you, if you're pulling 40 pounds, you're holding- Recurve pounds. is like your traditional, just bow and arrow, bow and arrow, where there's no technology factored in whatsoever. You're just yeah. pulling all the way back, right? Yeah, I mean, Technically, there's a longbow, which is like the it's just the, the typical crescent moon shaped. So the recurve was the iteration on that, where it kind of bent back, it recurved, uh, okay. gotcha, um, to hold a little bit more. But the compound was just kind you of just thin. yeah. So that's the other thing too. It's like well, the a lot of recurve shooters didn't get a ton of sponsorships, but you can't go into the Olympics if you're not. Uh, recurve shooter. So Damn. Really, like, difficult. And know. even if you make it to the Olympics as, like, one of the best recurve shooters, you're probably still vying for, like, the most niche of niche yeah. sponsorships. Like, you're almost, like, lucky to get one in general, like, because they're so niche. Yeah, exactly. It's not like Nike is calling you up or anything. Like, and it, maybe they'll give you a pair of shoes or something. But, you know, yeah. you're not the, the real... Ones would be from an archery company that you're probably already shooting for. Exactly, no one yeah. Knows unless they're already in it. You were talking about how you had this entrepreneurial background because you saw like your dad running the archery shop. Yeah, so that inspired a lot of my curiosity because I'm seeing the difference in margins. You know, like all the things that go along with running a business, right? Yeah, and for a small business, if you make thirty percent off something, that's that's pretty standard. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, universal, it's like at least you're making 80%, you know, like almost like it's crazy the amount yeah. that they're like overcharged. And I remember like speaking to my dad. a lot of me. big businesses. Yeah. They've just got it figured out like that. Yeah. It's one of those situations. I compare it a lot to the airport where it's like you can charge that because 
where else are you going to go? You're trapped. The captive audience. Yeah, exactly. So I remember bringing that up to my dad when he visited me. He was like, oh, you, the, the revenue. You would be so jealous of the revenue. And he's like, yeah, but I'm not jealous of the overhead. <laughs> yeah. A very good oh, point. yeah, the overhead of, I mean, just being universal. Yeah. I cannot imagine being the person that's in charge, like the the like CFO, per se, of Universal is probably – a very stressed person. Yeah. Shout out to thinking. whoever you are if you're the CFO of Universal. I don't yeah. envy you. It seems like they don't stay for very long. I mean, you know, I think it's standard, like maybe five years or something. But it's like I just don't think it's a job that most people really want. Like you just get blamed for things that you don't yeah. control over. And I could tell you I'm – I don't. I don't think I've ever even said this on the podcast because I just don't talk about it that much. I'm technically the CFO of, of my company right now. The company is growing really fast, which is awesome. But mm-hmm. being the CFO is really tough. Yeah, and I'm constantly looking w- for ways to kind of like outsource parts of my position because it's just it's a thankless, difficult job. Mm-hmm. We were. This is an interesting segue actually to talk about we really interesting thing is that we actually had a position where we worked on a team together way back in college. We were on the executive board of our fraternity together. Yeah. You were the secretary. I was the treasurer. And I learned this lesson very early on is that the, I was essentially the like CFO of the, the fraternity. Right. It's a thankless and terrible job. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> any of them. I mean, especially. You get all the heat and none of the thanks. Mm-hmm. Most leadership, you kind of do see that. And I would see a lot. Yeah. It is a general trend with leadership. You kind of have to accept that as that it's a, it could be a thankless thing. Yeah. And I think that that kind of experience kind of helped me too, in a sense. I think a lot of people I would see when I had peers as associates blame managers for everything. Oh, they suck for this. But you have way more empathy and insight to that's probably not their fault. Or, well, this is really at a scale, you know, they can't think about. Joe Schmo, when you're thinking about 10 million Joe Schmoes, you know, like you can try to factor it in, but exactly, it's just, it's difficult. So being able to like process that, I guess, helped a lot. I think in that position, I really learned that I was good as like a problem solver. That's when I was kind of like, whatever I do, like my. That does seem like the general theme of what's allowed you to be so successful is just positioning yourself as the kind of go-to guy and problem solver, Mm -hmm. like in your organization, amongst your peers, amongst your managers. Yeah. Yeah. I guess when you put it like that, that is definitely like one of the biggest factors that I've had. What are a few of the things that you think have best positioned you to be that problem solver? I think I've just always cared about people. Like, I haven't been able to not. I kind of envy some people that kind of like. Just to to yeah, out, yeah. Exactly. So, like, when someone would ask me, even like a guest, just like, rant, like, do you have this? And what, like, I feel so let down. I think about it all day if I can't, if I can't get that thing or if I help them out. Right. Or so, it's kind of like more of a necessity for me than it's like, like customer really. service was in the veins. Yeah. yeah. And growing up, like in my, my dad's business, it was huge, especially it was just a clientele that I didn't totally agree with. I always wanted to get out of that town. Like I was like, um, well, you come from a pretty small town, right? You're from Vermont. Yep. And like very Northern Vermont too, right? Like yeah. pretty much like near the border of Canada. Yeah. I was like 15 minutes from Canada. Yeah. And you basically, completely flipped script and came to one of the biggest cities in the southeast yeah yeah that was kind of like my whole thing was like what's the opposite of a cold small town yeah so orlando is a very warm very large town that houses one of the biggest universities in the united states yeah yeah i came from my town had go nice charge on (laughs) right um i it was six thousand people in my town and that's why I know. It's wild to think about now. Because I remember going to UCF and being like, there was 60,000 at the time. It was like way more, I think, now. Like maybe almost 70. What drew you to UCF in the first place? Florida? Um, yeah, I, I would vacation here sometimes if we were lucky enough to come here. 
Uh, my dad brought it up randomly. There was a few. I checked. Out, FSU was big, mm-hmm. um, and I was going to go there. My dad kind of mentioned, oh, UCF? Like, okay. Because I would now. still say, like, as much credit as I love to give it, because I'm a UCF grad, mm-hmm. I would still call UCF, like, one of the, like, upcoming universities in Florida and not one of the predominant universities. Yeah. I would say obviously like if I'm if I'm being as honest as I need to be like UF and FSU have been the predominant universities for a very long time still really are but I think UCF will pass them. Mm-hmm. Lots of bias considered there. But it is kind of one of the the upcoming ones so it's always very interesting to talk about like someone being out of state and choosing UCF over the other ones. Yeah. Um People didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was, mm-hmm. you know? Um, people knew FSU. People know UF. But, like, yeah. from up there, you know, they're like, what? Central Florida, where's that? Mm-hmm. Orlando, like, they knew Orlando. But um, when I visited, I think it was kind of a mix of, like, the campuses and everything. It just kind of perfect circumstances because there were a few other schools I won't get into. But in Florida-wise, like, I visited UCF with my mom and then FSU and then UCF, it was, it was a gorgeous day. It was awesome. We ended up seeing a basketball game at the end, um, and it was it was great. And then FSU was just really cold and rainy. And, like, and so I think that kind of had some, like, subconscious bias with me. Sure. But also, I just felt like when I went to FSU, it was that, that old classic college, which I kind of was interested in at first. Sure. It was kind of like a lot of people are there. going in. Like, they want yeah. the – they want the – Going back to what we were talking about before, they want the idea of a great college experience. Right, yeah. And I had kind of, my senior year of high school, I visited my cousin at Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. And I, that was that's reminded me so much of FSU. So I was like, oh, perfect. Like, this is it. Like, that's what I wanted because I wanted a Virginia Tech kind of thing. But then when I went to UCF, it kind of gave some things because UCF seems so modern. Mm-hmm. I looked at towers. I was like, what? That looks like a resort. Like, that looks like... Yeah. That kind of, like, I didn't even know. Like, it surpassed my expectations mm-hmm. almost in that way. And so and I looked at Tallahassee, and I was like, well, that's just one of those small towns where everyone's just kind of, I mean, small and smaller, but, like, everyone's there. There's nothing to do but drink and that kind of thing. And I yeah. was like, I kind of came from one of those, you know? And I, it's, it's a step up, but it's Orlando is, like, huger. So yeah, that kind of solidified it for me. I love that. I, I've actually, I haven't mentioned this on the podcast yet, but like my own experience, like choosing UCF, I was kind of between UCF and UF. Both of my parents went to UF and met there actually. So I grew up like a huge Gator fan. Like all roads were kind of pointing to me going to UF, like if I was to choose somewhere. But I, I had planned to tour UCF anyway and probably would have toured like UCF, UF, and FSU. But I toured UCF first for whatever reason and had been to UF a ton of times, never really UCF. Stepped foot on the UCF campus and I was sold like immediately. Like yeah. just seeing the campus, it, it felt like an entire city of its own to me. Like it's an entire little city. And then just like Knowing Orlando from, like, visiting the parks growing up, like, was one thing. But, like, just being in it and, like, kind of soaking in the entirety of Orlando as a city, I was just like, damn, this is this is where I want to be. Yeah. And I actually didn't even tour UF after that. I didn't apply or anything. I didn't apply anywhere else besides, um, well, I was from Jacksonville, so I applied to UNF as well just as, like, a fallback. But I only applied to UNF and UCF because I had toured there, and I was like, "This is this is where I want to go. This is I'm putting all my eggs in this basket. This is where I want to do it because it's just such a cool city." Yeah, yeah, like you said, it was. I think my aunt went there once. She said it's literally like a city. There's it some, is. Some of the people I grew up with, they don't love that. They love their small town and mm-hmm. their, like familiarity. Sure, it's not for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I love change. I kind of need change. Almost. Yeah. Like and that kind of thing. I remember looking like, oh my God, like I can meet a new person every day. Yeah. That's new for me. Like I, that was not possible. Damn. Now I'm like. Yeah, you came from a city of, or a town of 6,000 people. Yeah. It's the exactly. complete opposite for you. Yeah. So that was great. I remember like 
driving. I think we stopped at the Panera in University before we got there, and it was crazy. It was bustling. Everyone's there. And my mom's like, who would want to go here? And I was just, like, wide-eyed. Like, I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I would want to go there. Yeah. I want to wait for 15 minutes for my soup. Yeah. <laughs> just think about all the possibilities of, like, all these people. and I don't know. It was, yeah. It was cool. No, it's, a, it's a, just a very exciting vibe for those who like that kind of vibe. I, I relate to that a lot. Like, I... I just like to be in the heat of a lot of people everywhere, a lot of buzz, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And for anyone who's into that, that UCF is the place to be. Oh yeah, I would like recommend 60, UCF all the time. Sixty, what seven thousand going on? Probably seventy, maybe above seventy thousand students now. Like it's yeah, we're we're going crazy. Yeah, and like you were mentioning, people know now when I go back, like they know UCF. I yeah for our football run. Undoubtedly, that's what put us national champions, play. right? <laughs> yeah, Peach Bowl. Yeah, that was a crazy game. Yeah, that's a that's one of the we games. we went to that together. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that was that was an insane time. And then we came back, and I remember we went to at least one of the parades together. I think both. Mm-hmm. We went to the. We came back and like, UCF just we just declared ourselves national champions, and we had. Yep a parade downtown and one through Disney. It was mm-hmm. insane. <laughs> yeah. No, it was the best. Yeah. We had talked about kind of growing up, just being exposed to like business ownership and the types of things that that had taught you. What are like, what are the biggest things that enticed you about seeing business ownership that stuck with you kind of over the years after having grown up seeing it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is interesting because I think it might be a little different from yours because the way that I've seen you talking about it, um, you were very inspired. You, like, knew, like, when you watched your dad do it, you were just like, yep, that's me for sure. Um, I kind of had a little more reservations almost. I felt my grandpa started the business and my dad kind of took it over. Is He kind of at first wanted to do something else and then fell into it, and I never felt like he always super wanted to do it. I think that's pretty typical with second-generation business ownership. Yeah, watching do that, and I didn't want to be in the town, and it seemed he did love what he did at the end of the day, but, like, did seem more of, like, an obligation. I remember I would go with him to these business conferences when I was younger about the time that I was like big in archery and like they there was one vendor that they brought us to dinner and then they made a toast pretty much to me because they said wow like look at this third generation business owner what a a striving business success like congrats and everyone's like yeah I'm like oh my god I don't want to yeah you know and so that was like a lot of guilt I felt putting that on yeah so for a while I was like I don't even know about this whole business thing like let alone the entrepreneurship but those things kind of like follow you they kind of like find you on your way back when I was started I got the business degree because I've always had that affinity for it and I do love it and I would yeah ever since I met you whenever we kind of broached the topic of business and entrepreneurship like it it does it, it lights you up like you always I've always observed that you really like talking about it yeah, business is just great because, I mean, just in short, I, it's just something you can always get better at. Either yeah. never like a finite, like, I did it, you know? Like, it's just always room for improvement. I think that's great. Another thing I like about it is, is it, it's exactly what you want it to be. It can be anything you want it to be. Yeah. Do you think about one thing I've learned kind of being in the space I'm in now and, like, writing contracts, being involved in the writing of contracts, is that really business is – it's such a great place as a creative. It's yeah. it's a great place to be as a creative because you can you can take anything you can think of and just create a business out of it by writing it into law, writing it into contract. And a contract is really just someone's projection of what they want an arrangement to look like. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point to bring up because I definitely had a lot of people see those things as kind of like juxtaposed almost like business and creativity but um they seem like they would contradict for some reason just because yeah. you imagine like the the kind of um 
archetype of both, right? You imagine a creative, like, first thing your mind jumps to is probably, like, an artist just, like, slinging paint over a canvas, right? Doing, like, their own thing in their, like, studio apartment. When you think of a businessman, you think of someone, like, in a suit and tie, like, doing the whole, like, the corporate nine-to-five thing, like, super structured. It, I really think there is a great space to think of the two as a combination and that you you really can be a creative in business. You can take your creative thoughts and make any kind of business you could possibly think of out of them by just literally writing it into law. The, yeah. the tools and the resources are there. Yeah, that's um that's a huge inspiration for why what I do now. I guess maybe we can jump through so I can get there, but um coming back to my business experience. So I did the inventory management. Um did a lot. It, I think it was a great experience. It was hard work and a lot of people um didn't want to do it because it was hard work. Yeah. Um but what do you think anyway. kept you going through it despite that? Um, I really just wanted to be challenged. It was something that challenged me all the time. And I knew if I went back, I, I would just be so bored. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> there are definitely moments where you just want to explode, especially like being in the park and all these things. And sometimes you got to drop something because something's on fire, hopefully, theoretically. Sounds like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe not always theoretically, yeah. but hopefully theoretically. I think that parallels business ownership a lot. That's, yeah, that's what you see as a business owner is there's probably always something on fire and it's actually kind of your job to just run around putting out the fires, yeah. especially if you're the owner over like a few other people that are kind of handling the operations. It's really just your job to always be putting out the fires. So I think you're getting a really good kind of base of training for that if that's what you want one day. Yeah, absolutely. And it that path that I was going on was definitely while you were a part of a huge company you, you were essentially uh, your own business owner of this area yeah kind of, you got to make a lot of decisions a lot of things set in stone in corporate but like I like that you thought of it that way I don't think most people would think of it that way as being like a, the business owner of that area yeah you know some people don't and maybe I have to fool myself into thinking that but I, I do think that that they really give you that freedom, especially if you prove that you can have that. So I was continuing with this. I always keep an eye out for, like, other things. But I guess this is maybe my, like, safety school kind of mm-hmm. thing. So it's like at least I can succeed in this, and it, it will give me, like, just so much experience here. Um, I had some checkups. I would always check up with my my main manager. Just uh, Three months in, I think I went, hey, you know, like, I think there were there were people in other areas that wanted me to move over in in my position, and I kind of brought it up with him, right? Because I was just genuinely like, "What do you think?" Like, my he's been there for like twelve years or something, so I was like, "What do you think about going here, going there?" They want me to go there laterally, and he was just kind of like, "Well, you know, for whatever reason, I don't think that would be great. I don't think it would be better. I focus on development a lot, but like." why don't you become a trainer? That would give you great, so, so you can train other people and, um, you know, gives you a little pay bump as well, but. Not as much of a lateral move. Yeah, exactly. So he's like, well, the, even having that conversation, right, was just kind of like, you know, it's not like I was purposely going in like, oh, I'm gonna leave if I like don't get a promotion. Mm-hmm. But like having that open, honest conversation really helped. The transparency that you mentioned earlier, just bringing up the fact that you would like to progress, I feel like is enough to really just broach the topic of like, hey, what kind of positions are there out there for someone like me who's looking to progress? Yeah, yeah, and there's kind of this one pathway there and with a few other ones and um, finding the area to grow in the best. Mm -hmm. I think that helps, so... That was good. It kind of made me more of that man I was talking about earlier where it's like he can do everything because I think I just had one day where I was doing this. I was handling this massive shipment and then a bunch of stuff went on and I was like, oh, hey, like we have this new person from this other area. Can you jump in and do that? And just just chaotic stuff. But I kind of feel I thrive in that even if I don't love it in the moment. Like 
when I know it's going to happen, but like while it's happening, I feel like I do pretty well. And we've kind of talked about a lot of this in like a, a roundabout kind of way of like really like talking about your progression, but I I have literally observed like every time I've talked to you in the last like six months to a year, it seems like you've had a promotion every few months. Like, so I really want to drive the point home that by kind of positioning yourself as a problem solver and really learning everything there is to learn in an area, whether it is exactly what you want to be doing at the time, mm-hmm. you've really, really positioned yourself to be the clear choice to promote because you know things. You're there, you're ready, you're available to be the guy to go to. Yeah. You're just the go-to guy in your Um, department, whatever you're doing. Yeah, huge success, um, huge point of my success for me. And I think there were, from that inventory position I was talking about, there was one one person there, you know, that there's kind of a lot of people like this person, but they were kind of mentioning, oh, you know, I would go for that, but um, I don't love the hours or it's it's more work and I don't think it's worth it. And I just kind of, uh, there's other ways to progress. And, and that person's been there for forever and I've seen them reject opportunities every time. Will, will you do some extra work? Like, no, I don't want to do some extra work, you know? And I, I find it hard to picture those kind of people moving up if you don't take that sure right? yeah and so you got to make sacrifices yeah and i think it kind of does pay off and sometimes i did doubt myself i'm like did i really take this on and like is it gonna pay off is mm-hmm. noticing but i for anyone that feels that way like they you do. don't seem ridden with any regrets about it no it's absolutely paid off for me 100 yeah. percent. and um yeah so that I think that's a huge point of success um, and just constant. I think every day I just want to have that mentality. Like, how can I get better? How can I be the maximum person today to reach next time? Um, eventually, so it ended up being, so three months after the trainer thing, but six months from the inventory thing, um, I kind of got this position. There were whispers. My manager was like, hey, like, there's a cash coordinator position in um, this other area. And like, I know him, other people have recommended you for it already. And so like- I think What did that feel like to hear? That other people had recommended you for it? Um, it was great. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to come off conceit or anything because I don't think I'm like that amazing, but I just knew my relationships with those people because I try to maximize relationships yeah. with everyone. and. Um, what does that mean to you, maximizing relationships? I mean, truly, like, you know, I find with anyone, whether it's a vendor that I see and I just kind of know I'm going to see you every day, so I want to, like, just have some sort of dialogue so it's more natural, or, like, someone else, like, getting the most n- knowledge from them and then also kind of... I don't know, I guess just, I never like met with these people kind of, yeah, well, this will be great in the long term. Just kind of like making the moment great because um, I just remember having this professor that was like, we had this 7 a.m. class and everyone's just kind of not there. And she's like, hey, like we have to be here. So like we have to make it fun, right? Like why would you not make it the, the best? So kind of. Making, making every moment the best that you can make it. Yeah, and doing that, maximizing it for yourself, and kind of, um, I don't know, just making sure people know who you are and what you're capable of and everything. I think that's just kind of best practice yeah. in a sense. And it, it definitely paid off. I think it tallied up. There were four people that, like, recommended me from other majors. That's pretty major. That, that's pretty telling, yeah. Yeah, so that was that was helpful. I mean, it does feel good. I kind of, when I heard the people, I was like, yeah, we have a good relationship. I mean, you know, sometimes it's just... Didn't like, come as a huge surprise. Yeah. I feel like I have a lot of potential, and I feel that some people don't utilize their potential. So, like, coming from where I was as, as an associate there, I kind of already felt like oh, I could do so much more than this. So, while- What are the top two things that you think anyone can do to just better utilize their potential 
So I like that point that you kind of harped on there. But what what do you think are like the top two things that you could do to just utilize your potential a little bit more? So I would say number one is getting yourself in in the right mindset. I think looking at your situation and making it the best, like really pointing out everything that's great and everything that you've came from and like, you know, sometimes people feel they want to be here, but they're here, but really focusing on how great it is that you are here and like everything. Having a positive and present outlook. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I think that gets you through it every time. Like even when I was uh, coming back from COVID and then I was out at the cart, like just starting like the this Hulk cart sling drinks in 90 degree weather, you know, that sucks. But like being able to preface it with, well, I used to visit here and, and people, I'm helping people like me to come visit and that kind of thing. Finding the silver lining. Yeah, I think that's number one. And then I think two would be to let everyone else know um, how w- your intentions and what you can do and and constantly proving if you're not proving what you can do or like I think you're kind of wasting your time a little bit at least going and saying what's the best I can do today what what can I do to make myself better than I was yesterday yeah I think that was kind of my thing going in every day that's awesome I really like that yeah prove your potential yeah. If you feel like you have potential, live it out and show it. Yeah, exactly. It's not I, an easy thing. to. It's easier said than done because a lot of people, myself included, I'm sure yourself included at times, deal with imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. But you got to just kind of like envision what you want for yourself and try to live it out and make it known. Yeah, and definitely – I think sometimes people listen to these like Gary V's and whatever, and they think like, if I'm not constantly maximizing every day, like every day you got to be perfect. Like, you know, sometimes you just have terrible days and that, that's sure. okay. Like whatever. But like, and not everyone's going to be Gary V. Gary yeah. V is a one of a kind. I mean, ultimately you're going to be what you want to be out of yourself. Right? Yeah. It's probably not going to look like going to garage sales every Saturday, like Gary V says you should be but you're gonna it's important to just focus on moving towards the best version of what you want to be for yourself yeah yeah and some people don't I was talking to someone recently and they were just like yeah you know career hasn't meant success for me and I was like yeah I was like well yeah I don't know like because like for me there success is like a pie of of slices Mm -hmm. balanced slices but career has been huge for me for just doing something you're passionate about like I said watching my father grow up and kind of the biggest slice of the pie for you right yeah it's something you spend a large portion of your life doing yeah like to be proud of it be excited to wake up and do it Mm -hmm. and like go home to whatever um but some people really you know it's just kind of clock in clock out and yeah other things make them happy and that's okay you Mm -hmm. know And, and sometimes in my position, especially the one that I, I ended up getting in that other area, it was a lot more support, a lot more like I've, I found myself mentoring a lot more people. And so sometimes yeah. I get frustrated with like um, just people who wouldn't maximize their potential or people who kind of felt a little more comfortable. But like I kind of found myself, you know, like if they're comfortable and they're happy and that's not what they want to be like the best, even if I do see that they could be, it's, it's just up to the individual person to really like realize that. You kind of answered the question I was going to ask anyway, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway, just in case you have like any other thoughts on it. What are, what are some ways you overcome that as a manager? The, the lack of filling in your kind of hopeful expectation of people. You know, overcoming it, it's really making every person the best version of them and not yeah. of of you. or Not of you or your expectations. Yeah, and I've kind of gone away from this I see myself in you kind of thing because it, it's a lot of projecting and a lot. everyone is so individual and different and, and just helping. I think everyone really when they're starting should just listen, do a yeah. lot of listening and like – 
really focus on that, let people talk, and then you can really find what they want and push them push them where they want to go, but don't totally turn them around. Yeah, don't try to push them in your own direction. Figure out the direction they want to go and push them in the best version of that. Yeah. Like. And, yeah, I just – doing something. Like kind of what I was talking about before, this person who's, well – I'll wait for this other op- this other opportunity, this other thing. But I just tell people, you know, especially in my experience, I've had more jobs that we haven't even mentioned that have given me experience that have helped me. I think doing something in another field can really help you be successful in ways you just can't even imagine. I love that point. A quick anecdote on that subject that you mentioned there, like the transfer of skills from one thing to another. There's so many things that I think kind of led me into this, but one of them is just being a personal trainer in the past, having like one-on-one experience, just dealing with people, talking to people, kind of like leading a conversation, I think is probably the biggest one. I cannot emphasize that point enough of like understanding the experience that you had in a given field and not seeing it as black and white as like what goes on your resume does that prove the exact point of what you're trying to do in the next thing but really thinking deeply about what kind of skills did i gain in this position what kind of experience did i have and how can that transfer into the next thing and i think it's important to give yourself more credit than you naturally would in that because you can dig deep and find things that you wouldn't otherwise that you that would come up naturally, but you wouldn't necessarily think to give yourself credit for. So about the position you have now, what is, what is the position that you're in now? And I know there's certain aspects of it that get into like territory that you can't necessarily divulge too much because it's competitive with other industries and so forth. But what is the position that you're in now? Yeah. So we touched on how I, I became that cash coordinator in that other area. I was there for three days, and then I went on vacation, and then I came back. And I got a call from this position I had applied for a few months ago, and they called me at the airport. I was in Washington, D.C., I remember, and they were just like, hey, you interviewed for this position. It was Universal Creative in for a finance coordinator, and I know you didn't get it last time, but like you interviewed so well, you were almost like they want you for this position. It's not even like open yet, but like we'll open it and they really want you to like be a part of that. And so I was like, fuck. <laughs> because yeah. It's going to be three days in this new That's thing. wild. And so and like kind of totally I, different department. Totally different because I was so focused in this, especially at that time, I kind of talked about this job being my safety school kind of thing, but I just got in this new position. I was kind of really focused on maximizing myself in that, and then maybe even my, the next step was really kind of being that manager of of the owner of that certain area. You know mm-hmm. what I'm talking about? So like, um, I was kind of in a different headspace, but it's totally different. Universal Creative really focuses on any new upcoming projects. Really, this blend of like you were saying, this business and this like technology creative side coming together anything that needs to be built that people are really excited about rides parks whatever sounds way more up your alley yeah and it definitely was kind of that thing that i had been waiting for it this was a year ago that you had applied for it originally no a few months ago but i I started again at this whole journey a year ago yeah i just came back up and i was like or whatever i'll just start at the bottom improve myself. glad you said that and gave some time to it because when you stack up all these promotions that you had it's very impressive i gotta say like you thank you kind of just constantly got promoted (laughs) i appreciate it it was definitely challenging and exciting i feel now that i've gotten this spoiler alert i did get it this time it's my first time now where i'm like okay i think i might be not comfortable i still want to move up in this department but you know like i'm i'm aware I you're happy know. about the direction you're going in a little bit more, yeah. Yeah, because every time I was like, Ugh, like I just I know I'm better. I know I'm better, and now yeah. now it's like, you know, I I know I have a lot of potential, but like I'm really kind of matching my 
my challenge, with my effort, with my intelligence and kind of. So this new position that I've just More started, fulfilled in general. Yeah, absolutely fulfilled. Yeah, so I'm a financial coordinator. I'm in the accounts payable part of the creative finance. So I'm basically approving contracts for vendors and everything. The main project that I'm working on, I did sign like an NDA. So there's a lot of things I can't talk about. But yeah. um, the main one is this well-known project that is Epic Universe. It's going to be Universal's biggest park. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be the biggest park in Orlando. As far it's as exciting. Like, yeah. So um, Big venture. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff. I mean, it's the most exciting thing. Even people at where I started, at the Associates, they're like, I just want to transfer and do what I'm doing now mm -hmm. there because it's going to be the best thing. But, yeah, it's great. Yeah, what a cool thing to be a part of something that's – it's going to be all growth-focused, too. Like, you're building an entirely new thing. Yeah, it totally. And innovating off of things and that we've done before, but, like um, – kind of taking our formula it's it's pretty great um coming from where i came from i've always liked universal a little better than disney me too actually i don't know what that is exactly i i always attributed it to just more roller coasters a little bit more focus on that yeah it but is. Yeah. i i don't know if that's the only thing what have been some of the observations that you've had working there that you think like solidify that you know i think the the biggest tagline is really like ride the movies and um disney, disney adults are brand. sweating right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> right um yeah <laughs> yeah disney has their own ecosystem and you, you know they bought in so much now they're just, just this huge ecosystem but there's so many different ips and they're really not in the same universe or anything like you said the rides are more intense it's rides where <laughs> i think we have a mutual friend um uh jonathan who mentioned me once he's just like he, he likes universal because he's like i went to disney with my little nephew and he rode every single ride that i rode like that <laughs> that's not intense enough like mm -hmm. i think i gotta be able to ride this but um, i gotta be able to ride stuff that the kids are scared of right they gotta build up to yeah, and there's things like the Velocicoaster, if you've ridden that. it's. A, I haven't yet, actually. Uh, Is that a newer one? Yeah, it's within maybe a year and a half. I, I've i got tickets. I can, I can send you. you oh, know, but all right. Subtle flex. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, if, yeah, it's. I think it's just the peak of everything, kind of like it's the fastest one. It's it's so smooth. It's smoother than the other ones, and. Which park is that in? Islands or Universal? Uh, it's an Islands. Islands, yeah. okay. Islands, I always saw as the one that was more roller coaster focused. It is. That was always the one that I would kind of go like gravitate towards if I was choosing one because it was like the Hulk was there. Yeah, the Hulk. They have the Hagrid's ride in Harry Potter there, which is really yeah, cool. yeah. The best of the Harry Potter rides. Mm -hmm. I think um, was it was it, so they changed it to a Harry Potter ride, but it used to be like the dragons ice and fire ride was in islands uh, the um, dueling dragons dueling yeah. dragons yeah what have been a couple of your favorite parts about the new position and just working on this park that's not even conceptually done yet right it's a completely new thing it's it's something that universal is instituting and building actively what have been a couple of your favorite parts about working on that just being a part of it is great in its own as a fan like i was just mentioning being young and coming I think like I've always wondered I had this this big moment I think when I walked into like the Seuss when I was younger the Seuss land it's a very unique area because the ground is different they kind of make like no line is straight in Seuss they make mm -hmm. it's just very like unique I remember it's one of those things where every little aspect is thought out in a way to make it feel like you're in a different world when you're walking through it. You do get that yeah. feeling when you're walking through a Seuss Landing. Yeah. I remember that too. I remember being so young and thinking like, wow, this is kind of like what I want. I want to create like worlds, mm -hmm. you know? And I kind of found that in video production and editing a lot is you can really create your own world, especially yeah. when you get more creative. Um, my own professional experience has been more, more vanilla, more standard, but like, um, that kind of drew me there but just being a part of that now to be a part of that process while i'm accounts payable so i'm not you know 
granting engineering decisions or anything, but being able to witness things and um, see them come through is is very exciting. And, and being a part of that, the energy the group has and, and seeing all of these things is great. Um, I think another thing that's really exciting for me is just um, one of the areas which we know is a thing, be- believe we've released an official map, but also we know in Hollywood they're building a Nintendo world. And mm-hmm. the, I have heard about that. Yeah, and they have the new movie that I want to talk about with Chris Pratt, and they're like, well, it's Chris Pratt's voice, whatever. That's by the Universal Company. That whole thing is so odd to me. There was yeah. so much buzz around, like, just the idea of Chris Pratt playing Mario and, like, so much so much thought about, like, what is a, pr- a Chris Pratt Mario voice going to sound like? And it's, I know. It's just his it's voice. It's his like, voice, right? <laughs> that's going to be so bizarre. Like, Mario is such a, like, renowned character where you imagine that, like, I was about to do the little noise, but I'm not going to. I don't, yeah. I don't want that to be recorded on audio. <laughs> but, like, you, you imagine, like, the Mario voice whenever you think of Mario. It's, I, I can't imagine. I don't think I'm going to watch it, honestly. It's such a yeah. it's such a weird thing to think about. I know. I probably will end up watching it, but I'm not confident in its um, yeah. quality. But yeah, like when I heard he just has such a unique voice, it's just weird. I thought he would do something, I, and I was on board. I was like, ah, Chris, you know, whatever, he'll do something. Yeah, but like exactly. I don't know. Whatever. But, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Maybe I will yeah. watch it. So we have a big a big partnership with them now because Illumination is doing that which illumination did minions and minions is now like like the mickey mouse of universal yeah Basically they're pushing that to be a part of that group that i grew up with that i had the the game boy i had all the way through i have the switch now and the gamecube i had you play nintendogs nintendogs oh, yeah, yeah. The ds for sure i had the special edition teal nintendo ds that <laughs> came with nintendogs oh my god wow okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got lucky and just like I, I think I happen to get it at the right time, but yeah, no Nintendo. Nintendo is it really hits home. Yeah, so I love uh, being around that and growing up with all those things, dreaming, kind of combining like what I said, like building a world and then and then a world that I I had grown up loving and is probably a pretty big part of me. I think that's that's huge. Um, and I think a third point would be just the the sheer like quality of life in in the creative offices they are so um the, such a great team i've it's even bigger than what i've met but um everyone's just so passionate like i, I think i mentioned a lot of associates you know they treat their job like high school and and not everyone there even if they don't treat it like high school maybe they just want to be in their comfortable position but felt feel like everyone here is very passionate and they're very driven and i i love to be surrounded by that i i want to be in a room of people that are smarter than me so i can just grow myself yeah um i feel that there and you know it's not google and silicon valley but from my jump from the parks to here it feels reminiscent of that you know it's the way the, the it's like the culture you've been looking and, for kind of thing. Yeah, and the culture and you go and there's um there's just schematics and and they have there's a whole wall of patents when you walk in and it, it's 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 so cool just to be there. It's it's very inspiring. It's just a good working environment. I was listening editing your previous podcast talking about a hybrid um place and this is a hybrid job as well. And, That's awesome. So you're yeah. you're there some of the time you're at home the rest of the time. Yeah. How does that hybrid model look for your position in particular? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, at the moment, it's two required days in, and you can choose whichever days you want. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yep. And um, you, we have like a rental. You rent out. We have a shared workspace office, and there, there's some that are like IT is there every day. The engineers are there every day building everything, but more of the finance, the accountants, the, the money side. The, it's it's a shared workspace that you rent it out, and, and so you can choose. So I, I love that because you can, you know, coming from the parks, it was stand here and don't leave the building. Yeah. And, and like, 
that we need someone here. And I had a moment uh, in my first few days, I walked in at like 8.05. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. They're like, yeah. calm down. Like, if, <laughs> like, no one's watching if you want to leave. And if I want, if, if I want to do more one day and I get off early Friday, you know, I can do that kind of thing. So the flexibility. The flexibility. Awesome, yeah, that is a huge thing to have. It, That's awesome. Yeah. They just treat you, treat you like an adult. Yeah. Like you, they know you're going to do your 40 hours of work and prioritize and do that kind of thing. Because you've earned your way there. You've, you've earned your, your place there because you did good work. Yeah, and one place, too, I noticed a lot of managers in merchandise, actually, it, some of them moved up and maybe 60% were moved up and 40%, I feel like, came from somewhere else. But a wide majority of people that I find creative came from where I came from. And they, they talk about, like, doing your time, and mm-hmm. your price, right, and kind of, like, earning away there. But, like, it's people who really understand, like, what goes on in the parks and, like, the luxury that we kind of have now and building upon that. And it just makes for a great environment. I That's think. awesome. I'm glad you found that. Yeah. Well, thanks. You know, it was uh, a year of hard work and, and dedication and a year in the grand scheme of things is not that long. Yeah. It's got there pretty it quick. feels like very long and very short at the same time. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Well, one thing I wanted to talk a little bit more about is, what you mentioned before, we haven't really mentioned this too much yet, but you've been helping me out a ton with the podcast over the past like number of months with just like some of the editing. And first of all, thank you. It's been <laughs> huge for me. I kind of just wanted to talk a little bit about that and what are some things that you've enjoyed about it and some things that you've learned kind of just being behind the scenes of it. Yeah, uh, well... You know, thank you for being. You're a great partner, and just thank always. you for thank you for being there and doing it. It's been it's been a huge help more than you realize. Yeah, I love that. It seems to strike a really big balance where I'm from, where I'm working at this kind of job that I maybe didn't think I would enjoy as much when I'm younger, but now I know that I do. It, it does include a lot. My um, finance coordinator job. It this job. With you, the editing provides a good balance of the creativity. And I think that that hones my skills, but it's also just kind of, like I said, I'm that night owl, right? So when I'm in there at like 1 a.m. with the uh, with my lights on in my office, like working, you know, I kind of just hitting that stride. Yeah, it's that good balance, and I can kind of like hit that. And and you're really good about flexible deadlines or working with me, and I think we've struck a good balance there. And I love editing it. Honestly, it's just you, you have such a great podcast where you... Oh, thank you. Y- yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to just gas you up all the time, but, like, <laughs> it's it's so interesting. Just everyone's so different, and it has this string of, like, a common theme with everyone being very professional and very ambitious and had, doing great things, but it's also so different, like, every every time. In the choosing of my guests, I, I like to try to make ambition the common denominator, like, just mm-hmm. people that are ambitious about whatever they're doing. yeah. It's, the people I'm looking to talk to yeah they and they have a lot to say definitely so that's really great and there's just things that have kind of like really gotten really great at with editing you just do it a lot and and you kind of you've forced me to become a better editor in a sense with like editing multicam you know there were some times where we've experimented or tried some people have extra stuff there and so we have a third camera and and being able to incorporate that. And even when I don't have a third camera, well, it's better to see multiple things at one time with, with two. And um, It's been so cool just seeing you take different creative liberties with it that I wouldn't have even thought of that provide like a, a certain value to the entire interview and recording that I would have just never thought of. You edited it a certain way where I probably wouldn't have edited it that way myself. And it's just like it it adds a certain like emphasis to it. Well, I'm glad to hear that you enjoy that. I think there's some moments where I'm like, I have to make like a personal choice because I feel like when I first came in, I was like, every time someone talks, I'm going to cut back and forth. Mm -hmm. And that just became like too chaotic. So I think you really kind of focus because sometimes I even notice myself now, right? I'm like, Sometimes I'm editing, like, shut up, shut up. Like, <laughs> like, but now I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, yeah, for sure. You know, like, kind of adding those kind of things. That's just natural dialogue. But I guess you kind of have to, like, 
hone in on what is the main message being conveyed in this particular moment and how do I follow that? Yeah. Right. And like, where's the energy coming from? And, and sometimes now with that multicam, I see some people doing things off screen that I'm kind of like, well, let me highlight that a little mm-hmm. bit because that, that adds to the point. So, yeah. Well, I, it's been, uh, it's been fantastic having you. It really has. It's been, it's cool that we finally got to do this because it's been, it's been very much like behind the scenes kind of work and now we're doing the podcast. Yeah. Thanks, man. It's nice to be on. Um, there's definitely some points where you're like, I hear you say, oh, I'll edit that out later. And I'm behind, I'm like, will you, Brody? Will you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's awesome. Uh, it's great to be a part of it. I think I was adding it up. I, we're a little over like 20 now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is which major is because 30 came out this week. So that's like the far majority. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, you've been thing. you've been helping me out for a long time now. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's awesome. A great, great partnership. For Absolutely. Sure. Mm-hmm. Well, kind of getting into the questions that I ask on every podcast that you, as my kind of behind the scenes guy, have become all too aware of. A couple questions that I ask in every interview. Mm-hmm. So I'll go ahead and hit you with the first one. Okay. I'm gonna kind of hone in on you starting about a year ago with Universal as like the anchor point for this. Cause I feel like a lot of our conversation is centered around that and like the kind of journey that that kicked off. If you could take the experience and wisdom that you've learned over that period of time and go back in time and talk to a younger Jake as he was first kind of getting into that first associate position, what are a few things that you would tell him to do differently getting into that? So, I am familiar with this question, and I always have trouble answering it in my head because I think the butterfly effect is so tough to deal with because, yeah, I would go back and say this and that. Maybe this specific thing was really embarrassing or this thing I shouldn't have done, but there's a, there's a lot of decisions that I made that maybe weren't the best, but it led me to where I am now. Yeah. Um, and there's just some things... You know, if I didn't work at Pat's Liquor in college, it would Mm -hmm. be some work ethic things I didn't get. Um, It is difficult to say because at the end of the day, I did end up where I was because I did all the things. I failed at all the right things. And you're happy with where you ended up and where you're going. Yeah. But I would say if there's anything throughout the entire theme of my life, I think I was so afraid of failure. I didn't want to be looked at as like, oh, he just... He failed at that. He's not good enough at that. But I think what I've really learned growing up is failure is really a good thing. Like, you can't fail. You can't do anything right if you haven't failed and learned the best way to do it. You're really going out there, like, pioneering and, like, trying something out. And if I fail, sometimes I get a little bit excited because I'm like, I know the answer now. Yeah. I know the best, a better way to do it. Clear something up. So, yeah, just a readiness to fail. I I like that. That's awesome. And, of course, you know the other question already, but the show is called Profession Session. So my thesis with the show is that many, many different things can be a profession, right? A profession can look a lot of different ways and does look different to everyone. So my question is, what does it mean to you personally to be a professional? Being professional is definitely carrying yourself in a way that that you can interact with a lot of people. You can kind of put aside all your everything else and kind of work on this goal, I feel, is being professional. But being a professional, I feel, growing up, I remember when I was really little, someone told me, like, well, if you're a professional at something, that means you get paid for doing it. So I think the same day I heard that, I was doing archery, and I made someone a bet, and I was like, I bet you $5 I hit the bullseye. And they're like, okay. And then I made money. I was like, I'm a professional artist. <laughs> I did it. And I, my dad was just really encouraging. He's like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, you are a professional. And I think for me that stands out as breaking down barriers, breaking yeah. down that kind of like imposter syndrome that you're thinking like, does this really make me this? Is this gatekeeping this? I think that being a professional can really be, if I break it down to just making the money at something – I, would, I wouldn't want to let this professionalism define me as anything else. Like, I can do anything, and I can be a professional at anything if I really put the work into it. I feel like that's what it really means 
to me in a sense. Does, does that make sense? Putting the work into something is the being professional to you. Yeah. Like putting the work in and just really making it happen. Yeah, I see a lot of people who think, well, I can't do this because they were just born to do this or they they just kind of were structured to do this kind of thing. But it's like, no, you can't. Like if you really do try and you put in the effort, you can be a professional at that. Um, it really is just kind of getting there, putting in the steps. There's an equation to it. It's putting in the work plus time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. Well, Jake, anything else you would want to kind of talk about, provide to the audience? Anything, any parting thoughts that you have? Not really. I don't have anything to plug. Just, uh, just a guy here. But just do what makes you happy. Put all the effort into that and live your best life, I guess. Love it. Parting thought I would have is I'm excited for the Pusha T and IDK concert we're about to go to. Yes. It's yeah. Gonna be very exciting. It's going to be a blast. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being on. This has been awesome. It's been cool to finally do this because we talk about the podcast so much. Obviously, it's it's cool to have you on and actually get to go through the process with you and yeah. go through so many of your insane accomplishments that you've had over the over the past year. I mean, literally, I, I said it before, but you every time I talk to you, you're like getting promoted in one way or another with, with your position that you're in. Well, thanks for having me, man. Um, I think I'll be a little bit more next time. I'll probably be in the same position, but who knows? You know, we're, could we're be. It sounds like you found the position you were looking for. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited about it. So awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. This has been Profession Session. I've been your host, Brody Vincent. My guest has been Jake Pelkey of Universal, now in a very new and creative position where he's getting to be a big part of the new park that's being built and also the editor behind the scenes of Profession Session. We got to talk a little bit about that. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, this has been Profession Session. Thanks so much for tuning into Profession Session. I'm your host, Brody Vinson. Stay tuned for new episodes every week and short clips of deep dives into specific topics that I put out on different social media channels. We can be found on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, all major podcast platforms. You can find my guest in the details of this video or podcast. And if you happen to know a young standout business owner, professional, or entrepreneur that you would think would be a good fit for Profession Session, DM me or get in contact with me anywhere and just let me know and they could be the next to tell their story here until next time again this has been profession session stay focused stay hustling and stay networking